Many people are asking today, what will the new normal look like? With all the disruption and destabilization of virtually every sector of society, virtually every country on this globe, and with no immediate end in sight, people are wondering, will we go back to the way the world was four months ago? 10 months ago, a year ago? Will there be a new norm? What will the new normal look like? Reclaiming yourself is the theme that we're going to address. It's a very interesting question. What is normal? We use the word normal all the time. Here, the old norm, the new norm. What does normal mean? A normal person an abnormal person, a strange person, who determines what's normal, what's not normal, what's beyond normal, what's beneath normal? Very interesting question, no? I remember vividly, it's a memory that goes back now, yeah, 25 years. I was writing the book Toward a Meaningful Life. And uh, we were on a tight deadline. I had to deliver three chapters a week because we were working from uh, around August and by January I had to finish the entire manuscript. It was a book of 30 chapters. It was a very tough and very intense time, but so gratifying. You know, when you're in that pressure and you're in that zone... People ask me, how long did it take me to write the book? I always say three, 37 years and three months. All the years of thought and research and background and preparing me and then the actual writing. But when you're in that zone, when you're in that moment, there's a certain laser focus. But I remember I came to the last chapter. The chapter is called Redemption. Very intriguing name as well. We all seek redemption. Redemption from our mistakes redemption from our betrayals, others betraying us, betraying ourselves, redemption from many different ways. We could talk personal, global redemption, but being the last chapter in the book, it really demanded of me to really come with a, a, a stronger you know, closing bang, so to speak. And I remember it was late at night and I was working and working and this draft, another draft, it wasn't clicking. It wasn't clicking. I mean, I had already written 29 chapters, so there was a flow, there was a theme, there was a central thread. But I needed that that concluding, you know, when you finish the marathon, that last leg. So I decided, you know, I'm going to lie down. Because I remember maybe 1 a.m. In the, in the morning. Lie down, let me rethink it. This is what you do, you rethink it. Go back to the drawing board, back and forth. Around 3 a.m., I jump out of bed, maybe 4 a.m. And I said to myself, I have it. The challenge always brings out the best in you. The frustration, I couldn't get it. But then something came to me. And it was exactly this question, what is normal? You say redemption, you need to know redeemed from what? Maybe you're already redeemed. Why do you need to be redeemed? And that's what struck me. It remind, I was reminded of an analogy that I had heard in my earlier formative years, a very powerful analogy addressing the question, what defines what is normal? How do we know what is uh, real? Even better question, what is real? Let alone what is normal. And it's an analogy by Hasidic, uh, Hasidic masters that talks about a, uh, a family who was unfortunately very poor and they lived under the mercy, at the mercy of one of the big landowners in the old cities, in the old countries. And uh, they were subject to his whims. They couldn't pay their bills. They couldn't pay their debts. So finally, I mean, this is how the analogy goes. They were thrown into a pit. You will live now in this dungeon. He was a cruel man in this dungeon beneath the ground. But to keep them alive... A few times a day, a basket would be lowered down with food. Now, it wasn't a small dungeon. It was like a cave. Think of it as a dark cave. And in this cave, they grew up. 
The people who, of, of course, the parents knew what life was above the ground, so they knew what reality was. But now became a new reality. And the children who were young remembered little vague memories of what it was like up there. They looked up and they saw this hole. And they thought this is like the sun. And food comes down a few times a day. Anyway, generation passes, another generation, the old generation that remembers life as it was outside of this cave, this tunnel underground. Remember? But then they started dying. So it became a story that was passed on generation to generation. Let's cut to the chase. The punchline is that after a while, some people said, no, 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 this is reality. What are you talking about? That little hole is like a sun. We can't go over there. That's not a normal life. This is normal. This dark dungeon is our norm. Some say, no, but we heard from others that's not the case. I remember my grandfather and grandmother saying we once lived up there. Yeah, fantasies. You all have fantasies, myths, these primitive myths. And the analogy, of course, comes to teach us that our perspectives determine our realities. If you lived your entire life in a dungeon, in a cave, that becomes your normal. Completely defined by you. And although uh, someone living in the light, on the ground, up above, that's the normal, you're not aware of it. You may remember when the Matrix was that black bluster three-part film, or a film in three parts. And that was the talk, the talk of the town, because it was all built on the future, where the machines go to war with mankind that created those machines. They became more powerful than, than the humans. And they create a program, the machines, because they needed heat. The sun was blocked out due to the wars. And tragically, and, and, and most, uh, I mean, obscenely even, they get their life, their life energy comes from children, newborn children, which they harvest like batteries. Without getting into the chilling element of it, but they write a program to control human beings. And the program is exactly the reality as we know it. Everything you see, but it's a program, mind control. And people started saying, you know what? One second, maybe life is a program. And any proof or disproof is part of the program. With all the complexities of the plot of that film, not relevant here. So an intelligent person has to step back at times and say, what is normal? Is normal the thing that I just got accustomed to, that I grew up with? And that was the epiphany I came to. I ran, I remember, I ran to my office. I ran to, what was I using then, 95? I think, yeah, I was using a word processor for sure. And I typed up and I began. I say, imagine your life, you've lived your whole life in a certain reality, and you thought that is the given norm. And then someone asked you a question, or you give it some thought and realize, one second, maybe it's not. And that was the, I felt, the hook. That was the key punchline. That all our lives, looking for a meaningful life, there's trying to find meaning in the life that you know. But then there's a question whether the life you know is all there is. And not only is it all there is, is any of it real? Or what part of it is real? So let's ask that question to ourselves. We talk about normal. What will the no normal look like? First we have to define what normal is. So in most cases, we grew up, and I speak for myself as well, I grew up in the United States of America, free country, had my education, had my parents. You know, everybody's got their ups and downs, nothing is perfect. But you get a certain outlook on life, a perspective that you pick up first in your early formative years from your parents and educators and society and friends and peers. And then, of course, the media. And you develop a perspective. You have now an outlook. How much of it is accurate and not? Well, if you're a thinking person, you challenge certain assumptions, maybe more assumptions. But it's hard to challenge the whole thing because it's what you grew up with. This is what you are. This is the Dungeon or not, this is the world in which you live. But there are times in history that things get disrupted not by choice, despite us, which is exactly what happened in March when it officially became called the pandemic. They say it started earlier. That's why it's called COVID-19 for 2019. But regardless, for the mainstream and for the masses, it really was sometime in March where we started taking it seriously. 
not getting into whether we should have taken it seriously before, and the leaders or non-leaders, that's not relevant here. But something happened, a disruption that nobody could have expected, and nobody wanted, and nobody could have predicted. Every area of life, you couldn't go to work, schools closed, all public assembly, entertainment, theaters, films, the baseball season, travel, and of course, direct impact on the economy on so many levels, and it continues to. A disruption, not unlike an earthquake. Not perhaps direct destruction like uh, earthquake creates, but this created destruction as well. People died. The fears, the unknowns, which of course is the most paralyzing element. It I, I, it, it shook everything up. In some cases, things came to a standstill, even if not completely, and we were not prepared. So the normal, the reality that we are so familiar with is suddenly not quite what we thought it was. And what happened? Well, for many people, it became an opportunity. Suddenly I'm home. Maybe I should start appreciating my family in a new way. Schooling online, classes, programs. I can tell you for myself, I was already trained for this because my, my, <laughs> I sit in my studio and uh, even prior to COVID and do programs online all the time. But still, suddenly a new demand, a new receptivity, a new vulnerability. In so many areas it affected individuals and society. It's hard to even to sum them all up. So for many, we rose to the occasion and dug deeper and found deeper resources. Some have even challenged what is normal, but not enough, and that's, of course, why I'm addressing it. Others held on to the normal of the past and say, when will this nightmare be over? Maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, a few more days. I want to go back to normal life. I'm not criticizing if somebody has that gravitates to that. That would seem the normal way to go. Normal way. To go back to what it was. Why, we, why should we have disruption? Why can't I get my job back? Why can't I just go back to my entertainment, to whatever was going on, our schedules, our patterns, our routines? So whoever you may be, whether you're trying to gravitate back to that past, or you're coming to terms that this is lasting longer and maybe I should figure out what to do. Or you're in damage control and just trying to manage day to day. Or you indeed see this as a wake-up call and perhaps a way of looking at your life in a new way. Whoever you are and whatever, whatever defines your disposition is critical to consider that it's a good time to look at what normal is. And that's the blessing. I wish it didn't come with pain and disruption and job losses and deaths and, and illness and fears and so on. But it's here. That cannot be changed. So this is an excellent and perhaps unprecedented historical opportunity to ask what is normal. So maybe a good place to begin, besides this program right now, is to read the chapter on redemption, the last chapter in Toward a Meaningful Life, my book, because there it sums up the realities we know and opening ourselves up to new realities. So let's juxtapose those two as a, a study in contrast. So the reality that we know, let's start with that. The reality we know is a material world and through our empir empirical instruments, we identify what we think is reality. Let's begin on a very basic level, the things we experience on a sensory level. Sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. That's a very given reality, stimulated all the time, perhaps hyper-stimulated. What we see, what we hear, what we taste, touch, and smell. Now all of us know that reality is not limited to that because we also have emotional lives. What I love, what I'm attracted to, what I'm drawn to what I'm repelled by. We have intellectual lives, what stimulates our minds, ideas. 
the things we dream about, aspirations, goals, things perhaps a little more spiritual. What's the meaning of my life, my purpose in life? So as you climb this ladder and you broaden the, the horizon and the landscape of what you define reality, it's a nice, interesting picture. And everybody has their own uh, version of it. Depends a lot on circumstances. As I mentioned, where we grew up, what we were exposed to, how our parents were thinking or not thinking. Are we well-read, well-traveled? Were we exposed to people who are that way? Hearing different opinions. This is, again, very subjective and very difficult to, uh, in speaking to more than one person, every one of us has our own uh, structure, has our own Weltanschauung, world outlook. Some of it is narrower, some broader, but this is not a, this is not a, uh, we're not, it's not a contest here trying to compare perspectives. The fact is everybody has their perspective. They have their view. And then there are things that we grow. As we grow older, we learn new things, new realities. And we try to adapt. Some of them we resist because they don't fit into our structure or our comfort zone. Some of them we embrace. Some of us are in a very growing mood and we always want to grow and be challenged. All part of our reality. But is there more to that? As they say, there's the things you know, the things you know you don't know, the things you don't know you don't know, the unknown unknown. And that is beyond us. We don't even know we don't know it. So going back to the matrix analogy, matrix analogy or the analogy I mentioned about living in the cave, it could be with all our perspectives, it may just be the tip of the iceberg. And you know what? It may even be wrong in some cases. It reminds me always of the Chelem story, the Chelem farmer. So Chelem was this little town in Poland. They say it was a wise, people with wise people were lived in that town, but their neighbors were resentful, so they created the folklore, the legends of Chelem, about their foolishness. And they're used today, especially in, in psychology and recovery, many of these Chelem stories. You may know one of the most famous ones used, very popular today, about a guy who's looking for his keys in the dark. He lost his keys. He's looking and looking, can't find it. His neighbor comes by and says, let me help you. Let's begin from the beginning. Let's trace, where did you lose them? So he points 100 yards away. He says, so why are you looking here? He says, because here's where the light is shining. Saying we look in places, not where the real problem is, where it's painful to look or where it's too dark. We look where the light is shining. Just an example. So here's the story of the Chelem of farm, of the farmer of Chelem. The Chelem farmer. So far, Chelem, you can imagine, was a small town. But... In it was a little farm, small farm in Chelem, and the farmer of Chelem, this was his baby. He inherited from his parents and his grandparents and great-grandparents. He knew every grain of soil. It was a tiny little farm. One day he gets a visitor, a distant cousin from, uh, let's say, Iowa, a farm of thousands of acres. And there he's showing, he's giving him a royal tour of the Chelem farm. Very nice. They sit down to dinner. He says, so cousin, tell me, what do you think about my farm? Chela. He's so proud. Oh, it's such a nice little cute farm. But it's so tiny. The Chelem farm is taken aback. Tiny. How big is your farm in, uh, in Iowa? How is he going to describe to a Chelem provincial uh, farmer, peasant, who only knows nothing more, his whole, that his farm is larger than Chelem and maybe even larger than Poland? Not quite, but you can imagine. So he's thinking, well, how do I explain it to him? So he says, well, I'll, 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 I'll tell you how large my farm is. It takes me all day to travel with my tractor from one end of the farm to the next. He thought, okay, that'll give him some sense all day. Chelem Farmer, suddenly his voice and his sound and his eyes, he turns compassionate. With empathy, he says to his cousin, don't feel bad. I once had a tractor like that too. The Chelem farmer, not only did he not, cannot fathom that size of farm, he was convinced it takes him all day. It's not the farm. It's because he has an old, she reminded him of an old Shemata Jalopy that he had that took him all day to track from one end of the farm to the other end of the farm, to travel. It was basically from here to here, but it was old to crank it up and move it. 
So he was convinced it was the vehicle, not the farm. We all have our farms, my friends. Our farm is the perspectives we have. If someone says to you, what is the truth? You always should add one line. I could tell you the truth from my perspective. What I understand, what I've learned, based on the facts that I relate to. There may be a lot more. It may even be that I'm wrong in some ways. That's the humble and true, not just humble, the true response. If I was to pass out cards to each of you and say, are you open-minded, closed-minded, or narrow-minded? Are you objective or subjective? Most people would not mark the box narrow-minded, closed-minded. Because part of subjectivity is it makes us think we're objective. But that's where the mind comes and says, no, I'm not. I know I'm not. None of us are. And that's the opening and the beginning of objectivity, acknowledging that I have my limits, I have my blind spots, I have my prejudices, I have things I'm convinced are real and normal, but not necessarily. So we all have our farms. That's not the question. The question is, are you open to hear about a larger farm? You ask someone, what is the horizon? You ask someone, what does the horizon look like? If you're standing on the ground, it looks like one thing. Someone goes up 10 feet or 50 feet up on a mountain, it looks different. Different answer. I see a sky. I see another city. You go up a thousand feet, a whole new thing. I see only sky. I see land that goes stretches and stretches. And you say to yourself, which answer is correct? If you were there as a bystander, you're taking notes. One person says, I only see a hundred feet ahead of me. I see another mountain. I see ground. I see earth. I see some animals. Another person says, no, I see a sky, a horizon. I see another city. I see things that are a thousand feet beyond, a a thousand yards, maybe more several miles. Then someone else comes and says, what are you talking about? I see hundreds of miles. I can't even see what I can't see. Meaning there's so much beyond. Which one is right? The answer is all perspective. It's a very fundamental lesson. I know it sounds so simple, you could tell it to every child. But once we're there, once you're in it, in the here and now, all you see is your myopic view, your farm. So the word normal is a very elusive word, I would say. Normal? Depends who's normal. My normal? Your normal? Based on what? And it could be both normals are, are very fine normals, but they are based on a particular farm, a particular outlook. So then how do we go beyond this? What do we have within us? All I have are my tools, are my sensory tools, my super sensory tools, my mind, my heart. My imagination, my dreams, speaking to others, learning from others. I mean, at the end of the day, what more do we have? Well, the first thing we have is, the, is, the, is acknowledging that there's more, and perhaps more than the sum of all the parts I just described. That alone opens us up. Because then we start saying, one second, what about the mysteries of existence? What about the things I can't see? You climb to the top of the mountain, yes, it's hundreds of miles, thousands of miles. You go up in a plane, you see even more. You go to the moon, look what we've discovered in outer space. But how much more have we have never even seen? And how much is unknown unknown? There are things we could say, you know what, the solar system, there are many other solar systems, we haven't seen it, but most likely it's there, and even perhaps we have empirical proof it's there. Either through interpolation, ex- extrapolation, however... But what about things we cannot even extrapolate, we can't even say? How many layers are there beneath subatomic particles? We know there are elements, molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, sub-sub, sub-sub-sub, but how far down the rabbit hole can we go? Any intelligent person will say, we have no clue. How could could I answer that question? What am I going to say? There's another 10 and then we come to an end? Maybe when we come there, if we ever do, we find out there's a whole other, there's a million more, or there's infinite more. And then when you add into quantum mechanics into the picture, the fundamental things that are indeterministic, states of probability, uncertainty, not because of lack of knowledge, because fundamentally there are different dimensions. You start saying, one second, how many other dimensions are there that perhaps we can't even define as indeterministic? Well, the wise person comes to a conclusion that what I know is one little piece 
of something much greater. I can sense there is greater. How much greater, I will never know. But I know that I am just one piece of it. That is the ultimate truth. So essentially it's saying that normal and reality is actually very beyond us. And recognizing that it becomes the true normal and the true reality. As long as you hold on to, as long as you're obsessed or trapped or even addicted to your definition of reality and normal, you never get the true normal or true reality. You have your truth, your reality, your normal, your farm. But to get to that requires, yes, I'm going to use the word humility. In Hasidic terminology, it's called bittel. It's suspending yourself and your parameters, even your instruments, and realizing there's something so far more than I am. And it's actually, in a way, arrogant to ask the question whether I'm normal and real, and that is real. Because we're a part of a whole. Does the part dictate the whole, or does the whole dictate the part? This is what Abraham came to realize. Abraham came to realize. He was seeking. He knew the higher reality is more than me and my body, more than my father and my mother, more than my family, more than my community, more than my nation, more than earth, more than the sun and the moon and the stars, more than the solar system. Didn't know what it was, but there's definitely more. And where can I find it? How do I find it? And what did he come to? That assumption that I am going to find it means I'm the center of it all, and I'm going to find that reality. Reverse the statement. That reality is greater than I am. The part does not find the whole. The whole finds the part. The part doesn't dictate the whole. My logic is going to dictate that which is beyond logic, that put logic here in the first place, or that's more all-encompassing and is beyond everything that we can experience with our tools. So, of course, I know people are going to say, okay, this is the religious argument. We surrender to a God. You didn't hear me use that word. Intentionally. Because that word is filled with stereotypes and myths. I was using the process of elimination that the, the whole is greater than the, than the part. The Chelem farmer is also convinced his farm is the only reality. So you'll say, no, he's a child, he's, a, he's primitive, he's living in a shtetl. So how do you know we're not living in a shtetl, just a larger shtetl, a larger farm? And we know that today from science, from medicine, in so many areas. And look what happened now in the last few months. Everyone had it figured out, right? It was only going one direction. We had our plans and schedules. You know what? There's unknowns and there's unknown unknowns. And there's nothing wrong with that. As you embrace it, that you then are able to integrate and internalize the higher reality that's higher than we are. The mistake we make is that logic and mind and plans are going to determine what reality is. It can determine a piece of it, the farm that you occupy. It can go even further, recognizing there are things beyond your rational and your scope. Things you can't fathom. Maybe you can't fathom today, maybe tomorrow, maybe you just never will fathom. No problem, every intelligent person will acknowledge that. How far down the rabbit hole, how many levels of subatomic particles. How large is the universe? The surprise is that yet to come. But you're still saying, okay, my mind, my existing experience tells me there are things that are beyond my experience. But then there's a whole new way of looking at it. That the reality and norm is a completely other reality. We have merited and been blessed to be put here and we have one little piece of it. And then what happens is you completely suspend yourself you get absorbed into that higher reality. So it's not a higher reality based on, okay, I figured out what I could figure out, there are things I can't figure out, and therefore I acknowledge that, and I have humility. No, but there's another way of looking at it, that all of this that we have is a piece of it, maybe a very small piece, what they call the tip of the iceberg. So then, when we look at it that way, what is normal? What is real? Is it us determining what is normal and real? And then we can say, okay, there's new surprises, new things coming, but it's still on our terms. Or is there a higher reality that we can relate to 
that allows us, as we get absorbed by it, to experience something beyond even the unknown unknowns and even beyond that? And the answer is absolutely yes, because the peace has a part of the whole in it. There's a very fascinating statement. It goes back to the Rapsadja Gaon from the, um, uh, in the early uh, 9th century, 10th century, or even earlier. But the Baal Shem Tov made it more popular. It says that when you touch the essence of something, even if you touch one little fiber of it, one cell, one piece, you have all of it in there. Like the hologram. The whole is within the part. Now the part doesn't recognize that necessarily. But when, it allows our, when we allow ourselves to stand in awe and not think we're in control and we're the center of the universe, then the part becomes a reflection of the whole. Think of it like a drop of water can reflect the sun just like the entire Pacific Ocean or Atlantic Ocean can. Same sun. Yes, it's only a drop, but it's a drop of a larger whole. And by becoming and allowing ourselves to be, become part of that larger whole, that's when higher realities began emerging, even ones we cannot access directly through our minds and our hearts and even our imagination. Because we are stepping back and allowing ourselves to be a channel for something greater. And you hear that word a lot. You hear that word from artists, from athletes, from writers. They say, there comes a point, it wasn't mine, I just channeled it. They almost are not conscious. Now you need a lot of training to get to that point. But something then flows through us. Being in the zone, they call it. The self is not in the way. Your, your identity is not in the way. It becomes a channel for some higher truth, for some higher reality. But it requires your cooperation. It requires that you are receptive. If you fight and kick and fight and try to stop that and say, no, I want control. I know what my farm is like. I want my farm. You won't be able to access it. It won't channel through you. Now, we're not talking about losing what you have. We're not talking about giving up. It's giving up the perspective that what you have is all there is. That's the key. And I've been asked this question many times, and I, I don't like to bring up a sad, sad question, but nonetheless, I think it illuminates a very key point. Everyone asks the question, especially those that have suffered loss or death in families. And no one should know of this. God protect us all. Where does a soul go to after death? My father, my mother, my sibling, my friend. You know, everyone, again, should be live and be well and be healthy in many long years. But where does the soul go to? And as a teacher, a mentor, people are always asking me that question. For years, I always had no words. You know, I said, well, soul has its own journey, continues on. But then... Again, an epiphany, back to the normal, what's normal? I realized that the question itself is based on a false assumption. I won't say it in those words, because I'm not looking to talk about someone who's in a place of tragedy, trauma, to be sensitive. But everyone receives this well when I say it. I say, let me give you an analogy of an imaginary dialogue between a refrigerator and electricity. And the refrigerator says to electricity one day, where do you go to when they pull the plug? Where do you go? The refrigerator knows it needs electricity because that's what gives it, uh, that's what energizes it, the juice to refrigerate food. It needs electricity. Where do you go to when they pull the plug or when they shut the switch off? And the electricity responds incredulously. The chutzpah, the nerve. What kind of question is that? Where do I go? I was here long before you were ever invented. You're a little contraption, a box that they invented 100, 200 years ago. They figured out how to generate electricity, contain it in this box, you, to refrigerate or freeze food. <clears throat> and now you think you're the center of the universe. I'm it. Where do I go, you're asking me. I was here before you, I will be here after you. You know where I go? I go back to my natural place, my normal my normal is not confined in a little box like you. However, 
you define the space, the conceptual space, electricity, <coughs> excuse me, occupies. <clears throat> I go back to my normal. Coming into you is unnatural, is not normal for me, is not real for me. Being confined in a little box, that's not my natural ba- that's not my natural uh, habitat. I'm not confined. Can the refrigerator understand this? Most likely not. Whenever I share this answer, I don't even have to say what the analogy is for. People get it immediately. We ask the question, where does the soul go to? As if we're the center of the universe, our reality defines everything, our normal defines everything, and now where does the soul go to? Let's, for a moment, reverse it. No, that's the normal. We are just one little piece, the journey of life from birth, from conception to death. One piece of a massive, infinite, choreographed narrative. We are one, not even a chapter, maybe a chapter. We're one section of that narrative. Important, valuable, indispensable. You need every piece. But not the force that defines the beginning and end of it all. It's a piece of it. It's actually beautiful when you think of it that way. That way we are a continuum in history, that those that came before us, those that will come after us. We are each pieces of this narrative, meaning all of us human beings on this earth. Everything that happens, including the unknowns and the surprises and the uncertainties, including this pandemic and all the other cultural and personal upheavals it's creating, all part of it. Some of it we understand, some of it we don't. But don't let that define your farm, should not define you. It's a piece of you. When you think of it that way, then normal. What is the true normal? Look like. What will the new normal look like? Then it's a whole different story. I'm not just wanting to get back what I had yesterday, five months ago, five years ago. I want to open myself up to a whole new normal. A picture that's far greater than what we have. And radically different. Not disrupting necessarily. Not undermining what we have. But radically different. Like the horizon. When you're on top of the mountain, you don't lose sight of what's going on on the ground. You have that and much more. Introducing a new way of looking at things. And when you see that, when you're able to look at it in a new way, what do you see? So I'll share with you what we see. And where do I get this from? Not because I'm wiser than you or my farm is necessarily larger than yours. But when you read, and you read the vision, and you read the vision of tomorrow, of a greater world, a better world, and then you see the trajectory of history, the narrative, yes, the narrative, and you realize something, that this world can come to a place of total harmony within diversity, where there's no more hate, and no more fear, and no more corruption, and no more exploitation. Now, I know it sounds naive, it sounds very idealistic, but again, I ask you not to think with the eyes and the ears and the mind and the heart of existing norms. Because if you do that, you become a product of your own thinking. I'm not saying there aren't truths to it because we have seen, unfortunately, terrible things. But that's the farm we know. Now it's time to create a farm we don't know. And I would say beyond the farm. Or better than say to create, to reveal a far bigger picture. And this is what the true visionaries in history, when Isaiah the prophet writes, the day will come when there'll be no more evil or destruction because the world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. Divine knowledge, not just knowledge. You know, we could have a lot of information and be clueless. But a divine knowledge, one that's focused toward higher consciousness, higher purpose, value-based life. And it's a world where the wolf will lie with the lamb, which is taken both literally and metaphorically, meaning hostility will cease to be. How could a wolf lie with a lamb? Because conceptually, when you have a place of knowledge, when you're not preoccupied with your petty little farm, which of course will compete with other farms, and you're not defined by the love of power, but by the power of love and control, and maintaining your existing norm is not the driving goal of your life, then you can lie 
with an opposite, even a predator and prey. Not here to go into whether physically, how is that possible? Is on the natural, the natural that way? But there's a point that Isaiah is making. It means it can be hostile in natural terms, but there's a deeper norm taking place. When we see the divine image in which each of us has been created, and we see that each of us has a purpose in this, a, a play a role in this narrative that no one but you can play, and each of us respect that. Can this world become that way? And I say to you, yes, that is the new normal. I would say it's the original normal that has wandered off, been hijacked, has, been be- has betrayed itself, has lost its way. And we're reclaiming, we reclaim our lives. So for many people, okay, I have my bank accounts, I have my businesses, I have my family, I have my plans. Right now everything is on hold, fine. I'll wait until we continue, and then I go right back where I started, right back where I was. That would be sad. It would be tragic. Because it means here is an opportunity to embrace a true new normal, a much greater one. That would not negate what you've achieved. No one's suggesting throw it all out. Like I said before, the farm of Helen will always be there, but you know that's part of a larger reality. The cave is there. But you realize it's only a piece of the picture. There's much more. And maybe some of it is distorted because it's not all about you. You're not the center of the universe. That terrible thing. For some people, yes, they feel they'll be annihilated if that's the case. No. You'll find your true purpose. You'll actually be more meaningful and more significant when you realize you're a piece of something far greater than when you don't. You know, in the Matrix, yeah, the guy has the choice. Blue pill, red pill. He says, I'd rather have my illusion and comforts than my truth and discomforts. It's sad. He wants to go back to his farm. It's very comfortable, his little farm at Chelem. But think about it. What are you giving up? The truth. True reality. So ironically and paradoxically, when you hold on to what you have and you think this is your life, you have actually far less control. because It's not real. It's your illusion. It feels good for a while until there's another disruption. But when you're able to embrace a far bigger picture and realize your little story, your farm is also part of that bigger picture, then you become absolutely significant because you are a necessary component, a necessary element in the whole story. The whole is in each part, but you need to acknowledge as a whole, there's a larger reality. So the new normal has much to say about it. This is part of what we're dedicated to, myself, my life, Meaningful Life Center, is to envision and depict and portray what the new normal can look like. And then say, how do I get there? Essentially, it's about revealing a deeper truth in everything we do. That the material world in which we exist is only a means, it's only a shell, a surface to allow deeper spiritual energy and spiritual consciousness to emerge. From the meal we eat, from the simple phone calls and texts we make, from all all our interactions, has that deeper dimension. When you look with those eyes, not with the eyes of your little farm, you infuse every detail with infinite value. Yeah, you see infinity in the palm of your hand. You hold infinity in the palm of your hand in Blake's words. The detail reflects the, all, the entirety. But that's only when you embrace and internalize and ex- integrate that perspective. That, I would say, is quite a new normal worth fighting for. Because it affects everything. It affects our own personal lives, our family lives, our communities, nations, races, Everything. We need to create a pandemic of such higher consciousness. A pandemic of goodness and kindness. Not just because it's good to be nice and noble and giving. Because that's the reality of reality of truth of existence. That existence is really a symbiotic orchestra. Waiting for us to cooperate. Nature does it naturally. Humans have that choice. We can choose to just 
focus on my me and me and nothing but me. Me, me, me. Or we realize this deeper truth. And then we reclaim ourselves. You reclaim your life. Because you reclaim your life the way it was meant to be. If you think about it, children naturally have this sense. But as adults, we become jaded. And because we learn from people around us, we have our own agendas. You're not me. I'm not you. I have my own selfish needs, the selfish gene. And we become become convinced and we convince ourselves it's all about dog eats dog survival of the fittest. That's a normal that many, that is perhaps prevalent in our day and age, and many embrace. It's not the true normal, and it's not the real normal, and it's not the new normal. The new normal is the way it was always meant to be, in the words of Michelangelo, asked how do you sculpt those beautiful angels in the marble? He says, it's there. The angels are trapped in the marble, and I carved and carved and set them free. We're setting free. True redemption is not some new experience. It's the way it was always meant to be. A child in its mother's womb, completely engulfed, emerged, submerged. I said emerged, <laughs> submerged in a higher reality. And then each of us, interestingly, our individuality becomes far more real, far more infinite, far more permanent. Because it's not an individuality of self-made man, whatever I've accomplished, and that's that. You're part of a far greater picture. It's like recognizing that the elements which are made of molecules, which are made of atoms, which are made of subatomic particles, sub, 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 go all the way down, all of it becomes encompassed and informed and elevated by the whole. So the whole elevates every detail. We are going to focus in coming programs on defining more of the new normal and ways that we can personally access it Envision it, imagine it, and access it, and live up to those levels. This was an overview, which is necessary, but more than an overview. I did describe some of what that normal will look like, and it's up to us. That's the beautiful part. We are part of the unfolding drama. We're part of the script writer, the screenwriters. We have that ability to write the script with each other, to be not part of the problem, but part of the solution. So please join me in this effort. This is an unprecedented time in history. And we need to respond with unprecedented activities and programs, with vision and clarity and direction and courage and hope and resilience. Not just cures. Of course it includes that. But a longer term cure from the source, from the root, to infuse our own personal lives and our families' lives and our communities and by extension our sphere of influence no matter who and whom you can reach, wherever you can reach, with a new vision, with a new way of looking at life, a new way of looking at what is normal, what is real, and let that inform our existing farms and our existing realities and elevate it. We have the ability to lead the way So please join me and let me join you in a partnership to actually create a new vision for tomorrow of personal and global redemption. This has been Simon Jacobson, MeaningfulLife.com, where you can find a wide array of materials that discuss this in many different ways, especially in the last few months. We've really accelerated, beyond accelerated, because of the times in which we are in, the needs, the vulnerabilities, the new truths that are emerging and are being exposed, including the embracing of a new normal. So go to MeaningfulLife.com. Please share your thoughts, your feedback. We can use your support in every possible way, from material, financial support, to moral support and encouragement. And above all, each of us has our sphere of influence to reach. We're just a few degrees of separation from each other. Let's create that ripple effect, what they call today the viral effect. Even though we're dealing with a virus, but a good virus, a viral effect, a ripple butterfly effect, 
one light, one flame igniting another and another and another with this greater vision. This program is, part, is a master class that I give every Wednesday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But it's a part of a full schedule of programs and events which you can just see at all on MeaningfulLife.com. Many different ver- platforms, lengths, formats, topics, you name it. And if there's something you want me to discuss, you want us to cover, please, I'm inviting you, I'm welcoming you, I'm actually encouraging you to share your thoughts and your feedback and ideas, which we will address in the coming future. May we all together create the revolution necessary, the healthy spiritual revolution of a higher consciousness, of a new vision for tomorrow, being part of the solution and creating the new normal and reclaiming yourself and reclaiming the world and reclaiming our destiny. Thank you so much. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.